This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting from the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris, France, where a conference is going on about the importance of the free flow of information around the world. Well, the African nation of Namibia found itself in the news last week after President Trump mispronounced its name during a speech at the United Nations. Uganda has made incredible strides in the battle against HIV-AIDS. In Guinea and Nigeria, you fought a horrifying Ebola outbreak. Nambia's health system is increasingly self-sufficient. President Trump's reference to the non-existent Nambia left many observers confused as to whether he was referring to the Gambia or was it Zambia? Could it be Namibia? White House officials later clarified to say Trump meant to say Namibia. During that same speech, Trump congratulated African leaders for helping make his friends rich. Africa has tremendous business potential. I have so many friends going to your countries trying to get rich. I congratulate you. They're spending a lot of money. Well, that was President Trump at the United Nations. We're joined now by one of Namibia's best-known journalists, Gwen Lister. She's in Paris to speak today here at the UNESCO Talks, founding editor of the independent newspaper The Namibian, which reported critically on apartheid South Africa, to say the least. During the 80s, she was jailed twice. Her newspaper's office was destroyed by arson. The building was later firebombed in the 1990s, after Namibia became independent. Gwen Lister has since become a leading advocate for press freedom. She's a founding member of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which gained fame for publishing the Panama Papers, which exposed how the world's rich used tax havens to hide their wealth. Gwen Lister is speaking today here at UNESCO to mark the International Day for the Universal Access to Information. Gwen Lister, it's great to have you here at Thank Democracy you, Amy. Now. Good to be here. So let's talk about um, your country. About well, why don't you share with the world how exactly you pronounce Namibia? Namibia. Now I won't say this was big news in the United States, which gives very little coverage to Africa. Uh, what President Trump said, but talk about the what he said about your country. Well, I think the 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 news of the Nambia mispronunciation was received, obviously, with some laughter uh, by Namibia, not only Namibians but Africans further afield. Um, unfortunately, I was of the view that there was Trump at a dinner with all the African leaders, and not one of them bothered to correct him. But I think Twitter did the rectification later. Um, and according to our president, later, um, Trump put Namibia on the map um, simply by the mispronunciation. So talk about what he was referring to, the health care system. Well, he referred to the health care system. And I wasn't quite sure exactly why he, he referenced our healthcare system as one of the best in Africa. It probably is decent by African standards, but I think it had more to do with the fact that probably all he knows about our healthcare system is the fact uh, of the PEPFAR involvement in, in fighting the scourge of AIDS. And explain what that is, PEPFAR. Well, PEPFAR is obviously some uh, George W. Bush started it. Um, giving fairly substantial funds to fighting AIDS um, in Namibia. And then uh, talk about um, what Trump said about his friends getting rich. You tweeted, there's no question about Trump's colonial get-rich-quick menta mentality. You said, you just wish leaders of Africa had the guts to call him out on it. Exactly. Uh, well, obviously, I think Africa needs and wants investment, but they want uh, sort of good ethical investment and not just people who are coming out as the previous colonial regimes did and simply fleeced uh, African countries of the wealth and, and uh, you know, allowing all the money to leave the continent, as happens so often mm -hmm. with a lot of these uh, investors, so-called. You're here in Paris at UNESCO headquarters at the IPDC talks to talk about press freedom. Um, Give us your own story, Gwen. Uh, just share your stories about 
you as a journalist taking on apartheid, apartheid South Africa and what it meant for you? OK. Well, it seems like a very long time ago already, and it is. Um, but obviously, I felt it was very important back in the 70s and the 80s uh, to really show that there was resistance within Namibia, in my case, to the policy of apartheid. Um, as you're probably aware, at that time, very few so-called whites um, objected to those policies. So I felt it was very important in the first place to do that. Secondly, um, for a newspaper to be the voice of the voiceless people, because obviously, and that's very relevant to access to information today, is the fact that obviously we were totally dominated by South African propaganda at the time. But further afield in Africa wasn't great either. I mean, there were a number of draconian governments uh, in power in Africa, and they tended to control the means of information and all the media. And so I think probably one of the more significant things in my journalistic career was having the honor to, to chair, and I will reference it today, the, the 1991 um, UNESCO conference in Vintuk. Uh, which ended up, and it was a conference of African journalists, some of whom had been released from jails, Cameroon and elsewhere, to come and attend that conference. And that is where African journalists really affirmed the importance of an independent, pluralistic and free press for the continent. And I think it brought about a lot of change, at least in perceptions and more acceptance of press freedom. And I think that was definitely a milestone moment. And Namibia was really chosen as the venue for this, because uh, Namibia had finally attained its <coughs> independence in 1990 with a constitution which provided for all those fundamental human rights and freedoms. And talk about your own experience with jail. With jail. What well, happened while you were jailed? Um, uh, on most occasions, it, it had to do with uh, secret documents. Um, the uh, one case, which was probably the most uh, notorious, famous, whatever you like, was when I went to collect my mail one day. Uh, what year was that? This was in 1984. And um, I... This was, what, uh, six years before Nelson Mandela was released, mm. ten years before the multi... Uh, racial correct. elections in That's South correct. Africa. And it was, in fact, in the year where I was trying to set up uh, the Namibian and find the funding. So, And, and just for people who aren't aware, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, explain Namibia's relationship with South Africa. Namibia used to be called Southwest Africa. Absolutely. Uh, Namibia, yes, was seen as the sort of fifth colony of South Africa and governed as such. Um, and as I said, was, as you mentioned, uh, Southwest West Africa which we, even at the time prior to independence, regarded more as a geographical direction than the name of a country. Um, and so just before we started uh, the Namibian, we decided, in fact, we were the first to use that name um, inside the country. Even the liberation movement at the time fighting against South African occupation were known as the South West Africa People's Organization, SWAPA. Um, but we used the name for the newspaper, and obviously that caused huge controversy at the time. Um, but to jump back a little bit, uh, my arrest was mainly because uh, I had been to my post office box one day to collect mail and thought I'd come back for it later. And when I came back, the mail box was empty. So I'd called the postmaster general and said there's something very strange happening. Um, he said he would inquire, and it wasn't a matter of two, three days where I got a registered envelope in the, pre in the, in, in the post with top secret all over it, and it had been sent to me in error. And it was actually for the interception of all my incoming and outgoing mail for reasons of state security. So I released this document to the, the media and uh, was immediately arrested under the Official Secrets Act. So I spent about a week in jail um, for that, and I was warned of charges in terms of the act, but they were later dropped, I think mainly because it was going to be quite a big embarrassment to the South African government at the time. Mm. And the second time, Gwen, that you were arrested? The second time was also about a secret document, which um, during the transition phase, uh, South Africa had put in place in Namibia uh, kind of an alternative government, if you like, of, of local Namibians uh, to try and keep the, the possibility of a SWAPO government at bay. And also, of course, to 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 keep uh, Resolution 435, which was the UN resolution providing for elections for 
Africa's last colony to, to, to stop that from happening. So they installed a government of their choice, and that government um, uh, had advised of sweeping new powers for the police, and I'd got hold of this document, published it, and was subsequently arrested under detention without trial legislation. I wanted to ask you, uh, this is a story from a few months ago, uh, but in New York, a second hearing um, was scheduled in the case of two indigenous Namibian tribes um, that are suing the German government to demand compensation for Germany's genocide of 100,000 people in now Namibia between 1904 and, the and 1908, the killings carried out by German imperial troops when the region was a German colony. And that goes to a little more history right. for, um, for viewers and listeners around the world before Namibia. South African, yes, yes, explain. Um, well, basically, uh, it's been something that has only really come up in the last couple of years. Um, it, it may or may not have to do with the fact primarily that, obviously, Namibia's economy is pretty depressed. Uh, there's fairly large-scale unemployment. Uh, figures are not terribly reliable, but they're certainly over about 40 percent. Um, the Herero-speaking group in Namibia, which was the, the tribe most decimated um, under German colonial rule, also the Nama people, um, are not pleased with uh, the German government, which I think is, is our hugest uh, development aid partner. They've given massive amounts of money in lieu of uh, that genocide, I think. But now the local inhabitants really feel that's not enough, and they want, obviously, a very formal apology, plus, plus they're demanding millions. And so they've chosen to go to court in the U.S. at the same time that um, uh, bilateral negotiations are happening with the Namibian government and the German government about the genocide issue. Finally, Gwen Lester, as people here at UNESCO today are talking about Internet freedom and the free flow of information, Namibia is currently holding an Internet governance forum. Um, talk about the goals uh, that you feel Namibia should have going forward and what the um, challenges are around Internet and digital freedom, who has access also and who doesn't. Right. Um, Africa mostly, Namibia also, um, the access to uh, information via the Internet is mainly via a mobile phone. Internet, actual computer, laptop, penetration is very little indeed. So most people have a mobile phone. Um, Namibia, it must be said, uh, kind of tops the rankings of press freedom in Africa, and that's been acknowledged by Reporters Sans Frontier and other groups, CPJ and others. Um, so we're in a fairly good position. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we have this kind of advocacy activism all the time. Uh, we need to closely guard those freedoms. Democracy is a very fragile thing. Um, they are very uh, special to us, but there are still threats. Namibia at the moment is, for example, looking at um, implementing or, or putting before parliament a cybersecurity law. Um, and as we all know, cybersecurity is a very real issue in the world today, but often disguised and hidden in, in a law like that um, are possible infringements on access to the internet and monitoring of social media and so on. So, um, through the Namibia Media Trust, which I now head, which owns the Namibian, we monitor these kind of laws on an ongoing basis. Access to information is another law that has been promised by the Namibian government, and we actually work together with a group of uh, research institutions, media, developmental organizations to draft an ideal, progressive ATI law, but unfortunately the government are kind of sitting on that. So again. There's a lot of good intent, but also behind that are, and definitely some political machinations to take away those freedoms. So I think it's something that even though people can say we're free, we're not going to be free forever unless we really guard those freedoms jealously. Um, I want to thank you very much, Gwen Lister, for joining us. Gwen Lister, the founder and editor of the Namibian newspaper from 1985 to 2011, the first woman newspaper editor in Southern Africa. 
Uh, and before we go, a quick question about climate change. Um, you know that our president, the one who mispronounced your country's name, is a proud climate change denier. The effects of climate change in Namibia? Well, of course, we have the extremes of terrible drought. Uh, we've just come out of—we had some rain last year, but we'd come out of a three-year period of really debilitating drought. Um, even before I came here today, I mean, the temperatures in, in Namibia right now, and I mean, it's September, which is really spring, are sort of 40 degrees. And I mean, I've lived there for decades, and Centigrade. I've never—absolutely, yes. And I've never felt it, it, it actually that hot. Um, and then, of course, on the other extreme, when we finally do get rain, often it's a question of having floods. So definitely in Namibia, the, the climate change issue is very real indeed. Gwen Lister, thanks so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> she's a first, the first woman newspaper editor in Southern Africa. When we come back, the first woman president of Finland. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back with her in a moment.